You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 153 of the Common Descent Podcast. In this episode, we will be discussing armadillos. That's a fun topic. Yeah, I'm, this one was just delightful to research. Like the Armadillos are delightful. They're delightful. They're great. So we will be discussing this interesting group of creatures. Many of you probably are familiar. These are the armored, typically small-ish Animals known from South America and some here in North America. They are a bizarre group when compared to mammals today. They have many unique features. We'll be discussing what makes an armadillo, but also the other members that are in this group that we don't see around today. Because this group used to be, as is often the case, much more diverse and even weirder than just the selection we have today which means we will be visiting some of those ancient groups like glyptodonts and pampatheres, which were large armored mammals. Yeah, arguably large armadillos. Yes. <laughs> so th this is the episode for all your armored mammal needs. Yeah. Now, as usual, we are discussing this because it was requested. Our listeners who asked for this topic are Grady, Big Boss Man, Anna, and Lydia. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This was tons of fun. Good suggestions. Stay tuned after all the other stuff for the discussion. Now, we only have a couple announcements this time around before we get into the bulk of the episode. First off, to continue naming names, we have a Patreon. Sure do. And that Patreon, through the support of our donators, helps us run the podcast top to bottom. And when you sign up at a certain level, not only do you get lots of extra goodies like extra audio and contact with us and extra info about the episodes, but you also get your name shouted out. What's that sound like? It sounds a bit like this. So welcome, Saul, Megan, Jonathan, Drew, and Ned. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you to the support of all of our patrons. And if you're interested in getting that extra goodies or just helping us out, you can sign up to be a patron on our Patreon. Find a link in the episode description. You can also support us in a number of other ways. You can, by listening, you're already supporting us, but you can contact us through social media. You can send us mail with our physical mailing address. You can send us messages and requests through our email and all the other ways to contact us. Also, those are all in the episode description. And the final thing that's most recent is we do have an Audible affiliate link that you can use to get a month free and support the podcast, which you'll find down below. We are also reaching the end of the year, which means serendipitously that the next Alley episode is coming up soon. So get excited for her to be joining us once more. More plants. And the end of the year Q&A is around the corner. Yes, we have put up the end of the year Q&A question submission form. You can find that link in the episode description and also on our social medias and also on the Discord. If you haven't already, go submit a question for us to answer at the end of the year. We've already gotten a bunch of cool submissions, lots of good questions, lots of returning names that we always get, some names that I don't recognize. Yay. Yeah, so if this is your first time, this is a great time to submit any question. It can be personal, it can be fun, it can be silly, it can be serious, it can be scientific, and we'll answer as many as our fortitudes allow. These episodes can get quite long. <laughs> yeah. So in late December, we'll see how many of these questions we can get through. So keep them coming. And with that, we can wrap up the announcements and move on to our first official section, the, the news. news. Thought I'd try something new that <laughs> Every episode, we like to gather some recent scientific studies and news on those studies from paleontology, biology, evolution, earth history, helps us all stay up to date. So first off, what's the news, David? I have two newses, and the first one is about the consequences of plants. <laughs> oh. This is research by Matthew Smart et al., published in the GSA Bulletin. GSA is the Geological Society of America. At least I assume that's what it was. <laughs> the Great Scots Academy. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be linking, as always, in the blog post to each of these news articles. This one 
is an article in Science Alert written by Carly Casella. As we've discussed before, during the late Paleozoic, plants moved onto land and g- gradually took over the entire planet. It terraformed Earth. The whole thing. And there have been many questions uh, that paleontologists have pondered over time about what impacts that had on ecosystems, where you went from no plants and eventually with towering forests and things like that. Notably, this would not only have had an impact on land ecosystems, but also aquatic ecosystems. This study is specifically interested in figuring out what was the chemical impact of the development of land plants. Notably, in this case, what they're specifically looking at is the fact that plant roots pull up nutrients and make them available on the surface where they can then end up in other places. Yeah. So here they talked a lot about specifically phosphorus. Plant roots will pull up phosphorus from underground, and then that phosphorus can get weathered and eroded and end end up running off into lakes and rivers and oceans and stuff like that, which has led some scientists to suspect that when land plants started putting down roots and spreading and becoming more common— this might have increased the flux of certain nutrients like phosphorus into nearby waterways. And the influx of nutrients into waterways can have all sorts of impacts, messing with the water chemistry and sometimes leading to things like algal blooms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And blooms of algae can deplete oxygen. They can interfere with other organisms. And with all that in mind, some scientists have wondered and pointed at some potential evidence that the rise of land plants might have actually spelled bad news for things in nearby waterways. So land plants were effectively the first strip miners yes. that <laughs> pulling up dangerous <laughs> minerals and chemicals and, and, from the and ground. And dumping them into the water. And just leaving them around to wash away. <laughs> so in this study, they surveyed a bunch of different sites across the northern continents during the mid to late Devonian, which is a time period where land plants are expanding. This is a bit over 300 million years ago. They looked at the geochemistry of ancient lake beds and shoreline deposits, including several that overlap in time with known extinction events. Oh, wow. Uh, Specifically marine extinctions, where we have evidence that there was a decrease in marine diversity at these times. And what they found, according to the paper, are a number of different sites where the chemical evidence shows a lot of movement of phosphorus from land to water around the same time as key steps in land plant evolution and lining up roughly in time with extinction events. I mean, it all makes sense. And that does seem to at least support the hypothesis that plants were messing with land chemistry, which was messing with water chemistry, which was messing with water ecosystems. They also found that these events tended to link up to climate shifts, which also makes tons of sense because plants are very sensitive to climate and changing of climates. So it could be that shifting climates were driving the expansion of plants, and then plants were driving the motion of chemicals from land to water, and that was driving crises in the water. Which is an interesting point to make, because so often we talk about climactic shifts having these sort of effects and how those tend to sync up with extinction events and speciation events because new opportunities have opened up, but also old situations have changed. But it's not often that it gets linked with secondary causes, you know, that the extinction... Like the cascade down, the dominoes down the way. That the extinction or the, you know, species lowering or whatever it is might is not directly because of what happened with the climate but because of something that happened because (laughs) of the climate that's very interesting now this kind of study i knew when i saw these headlines Mm because there's all these headlines going around that are like tree roots cause mass extinctions yes it is always important and the authors from what i read of the paper are also very cautious in pointing out that It is very difficult, as we've discussed before, to line up things in timing exactly in the past. This is one of those situations where the logic makes sense. This is we we see similar effects in the world today. And the evidence does seem to suggest that this is certainly possible. Mm -hmm. 
but we will probably want more examples of places where it lines up. And I don't know how tight the dating is yeah. in these particular sites, but tighter dating, you know, a more precise geologic dating before we can start saying that this is a sure thing, that this absolutely happened. They also point out that plants would have moved onto land and had these kinds of effects at slightly different times mm -hmm. in slightly different places. So when you read a headline that says trees got on land and they had roots and then things in the water went extinct, that's yes, possibly, mm -hmm. likely in a number of places and scenarios, but it's a study in progress. Yes. Well, because these dynamics are very complicated in, in interactions. Like mm -hmm. you're dealing with many moving parts and we can't, because of the nature of the fossil record, we can only have a partial understanding of all those moving parts. And like, it could absolutely be that there is a connection, but it's not a cause effect. It's like the climate changes, things in the water suffer because of it. Mm -hmm. And then trees benefit, you know, roots benefit because of it. And the chemicals they put in keep those populations in the water from bouncing back or something. Sure, sure. That it's, it exasperated the situation, but it was not the cause of their extinction. We don't know. I always like to put that caveat yes. out there, especially when it's a very catchy and, a, and dramatic sounding conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is a cool hypothesis with supporting evidence, and maybe we'll see more details in the future. Also, just a quick little note. Finding examples from the past of when dramatic climate shifts or sudden influxes of pollutants from the land into the water causes biological declines. Also a handy thing to have in your case studies. Yeah, it's good information to be aware of. <laughs> well, my bit, of, my first bit of news uh, does not have much connection to plants, but it is about a Triassic aged croc shaped thing, but not a croc. And this is a new specimen that gave them insight in part, to part of the body that they don't usually get. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes when there's not a croc, you got to go for the next best thing. That's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> this research is by Rodrigo Temp Muller et al. in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology. And the article is a press release from phys.org credited to Bob Yurka. The specimen in question is from a group called the Proterochampsids, which are... Not archosaurs, so that's the group that includes dinosaurs, birds, crocs. It is close to them, probably an archosauriform. form. This was a carnivorous group, notable for very croc-shaped bodies, which was fairly common. Right. Yet another reptile that's not a croc, but kind of a croc. Yep. Long snouts, physical characteristics similar to today's crocs. I, they even mention at one point that likely living near or in water. This is a South American group, which is fitting for today's episode, known from the late Triassic, only ever found in Argentina and Brazil, so not a huge range. Okay. This new species is Stenoscaleta aranchicus, which was excavated from Brazil, dates about 230 million years old, and is notable for the, this research and the research of this group, because typically this group does not have well preserved limbs uh especially the hind limb and this one does have a well-preserved complete hind limb oh. along with configurations of the foot so not the full foot it didn't sound like but parts of that would connect to the foot yeah yeah so we have an a part of this group you know a part of the animal of this group that we don't usually get right we haven't seen those back legs much before and that's actually where the name came from. The name is a nod to the slenderness of the leg hmm. and the orange color of the rock it was found in. They estimated that this would have been an animal about 1.4 meters long. About four feet, four or five feet. Yep. And prop was walking on all fours, most likely. Probably also meat eater and likely also, you know, in the water or semi-aquatic or something similar. They were able to note some new information from that hind limb, though, that was interesting for the group. It had unusual features uh, to the group, which is why it was a new species. But it also has been very useful or likely will be very useful in future studies of muscular evolution for this group. Oh, yeah. Muscle attachments were be able, able to be noted on this leg, which also suggests that it was likely strong. It seems to be well-muscled, at least strong back limb. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know for, about the rest of these. Rising up on its hind legs <laughs> and running around like a frilled lizard. They also noted some features that had not been reported in other non-archosaur archosaur forms. Okay. Features more similar to dinosaurs, more similar to archosaurs, which indicates that what they had thought were typically archosaur features, dinosaurish features. Features you don't see outside of that big group. Exactly. Might have evolved earlier than was suspect that has been suspected up till now. And that is particularly interesting considering that features of the hind leg and foot are part of what is unique and identifiable in many archosaur groups. Absolutely. So if it turns out that those features aren't as particular to that group, that could change either how we interpret those features or how we interpret the line between the groups. Mm-hmm. And so this this hind limb has yielded more information than you might think a leg would. Identifications of new species are always fun to talk about because it's never just an identification of a new species. No. There's always something a little deeper that it's from a different time or a different place, or sometimes it has a body part that we just haven't looked at before. And that can provide information about things like how they moved or how they lived or the evolutionary history of that group. Well, it makes me think of how we've talked about that for different groups, there's often different you know, quote unquote, more important body parts to where mm-hmm. it's like, if you're dealing with mammals, teeth are really kind of the golden, the golden body part you want. If you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, frogs, you know, the hips can be very identifying and backbones for snakes and so on and so forth. But I also like that sometimes it's like, what's, what's the most important part of this animal that you'd like to find? It's like, well, the one we've been missing. Right. The part we haven't seen yet. <laughs> yeah. That would be really helpful. In this case, the back legs would be really, really good. And so they were. Very cool. Well, hey, you mentioned that your first news piece had basically nothing to do with my first news piece. Oh. Well, my next news piece has basically nothing to do with what you just talked Let's about. Let's keep this ball rolling. Now for something completely different. This is about signs of cooking from early hominins. That's cool. Yeah. Completely different from what yeah. you were talking about. This is research by Irit Zohar et al. in the journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. And we will link to an article on in Smithsonian Magazine by Sarah Kuta. So shifting from early reptiles to humans and <laughs> our lineage, which we only talk about every now and then on this podcast, cooking is kind of a big important thing that humans do. Yeah. Not something you really see outside of humans and thought to be really important in human evolution. That the actual act of cooking your food, using fire and heat to eat, cook to process the food you're about to eat is a a sign of knowing what you're doing Mm -hmm. that's that's tool use uh quite in a complicated way but also cooking has so many benefits it makes food easier to eat it makes it easier to digest it makes it easier to get nutrition out of the food yes it gets rid of diseases and pathogens like cooking is just better in basically all ways than eating raw food. Yeah, I think it's easy to forget how critical it is because it's just a given. Right, nowadays, well, yeah, you cook your food. Yeah, that's you how... You just eat it. That's how you make it food. Right. But it's not food until you cook it. Basically, all animal life doesn't do that. That's something we do. And it made a big difference when we started. <laughs> Which raises the question of when did we start? It's thought that our lineage, that humans and our cousins and ancestors, have been cooking for a while... But we don't have a lot of good evidence from the archaeological record of when exactly it may have started. There is evidence for hominin, our whole lineage, use of fire going way back with burnt things and charcoal in archaeological sites. But use of fire is not the same as cooking. No. That's a different set of evidence you need to find. The oldest definitive evidence, according to uh, what was written in this paper, for cooking are some plant remains at an African site about 170,000 years ago. Here, researchers report potentially an older example, a much older example. This potential evidence comes from an archaeological site called Gesher Banot Yaakov in Israel that is, I'm going to say that other number again for emphasis, the other one is 170,000. <laughs> this one is 780,000 years old. Wow. Which is not only way older, but way older than Homo sapiens. Yeah. This is thought to be a Homo erectus site, which is the probably the species that gave rise to our species. 
This site, apparently, no human remains directly, but there are stone tools and other signs of occupation, which isn't too unusual for sites of this nature. And what the research was focusing on is among the animal and plant remains at the site, there are multiple deposits with numerous assemblages of fish bones. Okay. And they compared these assemblages of fish bones to natural assemblages that are outside the archaeological sites and found a few interesting differences. For one, in this archaeological site, the fish bones tend to be clustered in small, specific areas. The fish are low in their diversity, mostly limited to two large species, (laughs) and there are hardly any bones from the fish. They're mostly all teeth. Oh, interesting. And they suggest that this seems to fit the idea that they may have been being cooked here because, number one, if they're clustered in different areas, those might be hearths Mm -hmm. or places where the cooking was taking place. The fact that it's a limited number of species, then it's just big ones, could be selection by people who are eating them. And when you cook, when exposed to high temperatures, the bones of fish tend to disintegrate away, but the teeth are more resilient. Mm -hmm. So this pattern seems to fit the idea that these were being cooked at this site. To double check this, they looked at the chemistry of the teeth themselves. They used a technique called X-ray powder diffraction. I don't know how that works, but what it does is it studies changes to the crystalline structure of tooth enamel. Okay. And you can, I've seen other studies that do stuff like this, where you can look for physical, uh, often microscopic patterns of stress or change that are typical of high temperatures. Yes. When you burn a thing, it changes in these ways. Absolutely. And what they found was that these fish teeth showed evidence of exposure to high temperatures. Specifically, temperatures between about 200 to 500 degrees Celsius, or 400 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which the authors note is not as high as you'd expect if they were put in a fire, but a temperature that you might expect to see if they were put near a fire. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And indeed, uh, anyone out there who cooks those temperatures are about the range that you might want to cook a fish. Yes. Like, even today. So with all this evidence together, they're suggesting that this seems to be a site where hominins were cooking fish. And if they're right, this would be by far the oldest direct evidence of hominins using fire to cook meals. Now, other authors have uh, piped in on some of the articles that have been written about this. To point out that that there are other potential explanations, Mm -hmm. one specifically that I saw was that it could be that these were fish remains that were disposed of either near a fire or maybe in a dying fire. Yeah. Like a fire while it was cooling down. So it could be that maybe people were eating these fish and then throwing the remains away and those were getting semi burned up. This is an alternative that was probably addressed in the paper itself, but I couldn't get access to the paper, so I don't know what these authors have to say in response to that. But suffice it to say, there are other possible explanations, but if this is indeed evidence of cooking, then it is milestone evidence of cooking. Which is fascinating for a number of reasons. One that immediately jumps out to me is just how we keep finding over and over that our non-homo sapien cousins or predecessors in this case were vastly more complex in their behavior and culture than they had been given credit for for so very long in our our knowledge and portrayal of them yeah the, these are our cousins they were doing a lot of the stuff that our early ancestors you know early people were doing which is why even if this turns out to not be actual evidence of cooking even if this is misinterpreted it isn't surprising to find no that other species and and earlier species of hominin would have been cooking yeah that's i I don't want to say it's it's certainly not a foregone conclusion but i don't think that a lot of experts would be baffled to learn that that seems like it would make a lot of sense well that if we do overturn this as evidence for cooking the reason should not be because it's homo erectus right (laughs) they were using tool they were using fire it makes perfect sense that they could have been heating up food and mm-hmm. eating it. This is one of those kinds of news stories that I like 
to pick up because it gets you thinking about all sorts of stuff. It gets you thinking about human evolution mm-hmm. and cooking and the nature of evidence and what is conclusive and what isn't. But also, I don't think we've ever on the podcast before gotten to discuss that scientists can look at bones and tell if they were burned or not. Right. That's just, that's a cool technique that is at our disposal at, at, in the scientific community. Also, if this is accurate evidence of cooking, I mean, that, that's got to make chef one of the oldest professions oh, yeah. on our planet. Like, Do you think there was a member of the Homo erectus group that lived here who was the one, like, this This one knows the very best, how far to keep it from mm-hmm. the fire? That, Almost- that person's fish are just the best fish. Surely. Sure. <laughs> well, because we see that with animals today. We'll see that where it's like, oh, you're really good at catching fish or, or gathering termites or, or finding the best fruit. I might just hang around with yeah, you. We're going we're gonna to stick around yeah. over here. <laughs> you might want to sh- you Maybe you want to share. Maybe you want to. I pick. I groom you. I groom you a bit. You share because you're real good at this. And if I don't have to get real good at this, that's awesome. <laughs> well, also. On a completely unrelated note. We have a theme. Giant turtles. Okay. Or at least giant turtle. Okay. This research is by Oster Castillo Visa et al. in Scientific Reports. And the article is by Jason Arun Murigisu in New Scientist. This research is identifying a new species of giant marine turtle. Does it have hind legs? It does have hind legs. Hey, there we go. So there's some consistency. This is notable for a couple reasons. One, marine turtles are pretty common in subtropical upper Cretaceous, so later Cretaceous, continental seas, so the areas that were over the continental land masses. Right, like our western interior seaway and such. Yes. This is especially true of the coastal areas that were the European archipelago, but unlike similar faunas that have been found here in North America, in Europe, none of these turtles had surpassed one and a half meters in shell length. So f- once again, a little bit more than four feet. Right, four or five feet, which is smaller even than our biggest sea turtles today. Exactly. So that is a decent sized sea turtle. That's, that's not a that's small a big turtle. That's a big turtle, but it is a you know it is a reasonable sized sea turtle. This specimen changes that. This new species is Leviathan Achilles enigmatica. Always a good day when you can work Leviathan into a species name. For real. This was found in Spain and dates back to about 72 to 83 million years old and is the largest turtle ever found in Europe by far, with an estimated shell measurement of 3.74 meters long. Wow. Yeah. That's a 10 plus foot long turtle. Yes. (laughs) This is massive. It is identified as a basal sea turtle, a basal chelonioid. So an early member of the grander sea turtle group. Yes, the ones that include our sea turtles today. Because there have been other marine there, there turtles sure <laughs> that are not the same as our sea turtles today. Yeah. This, Episode 60 for turtles, by the way. Yeah. One of the big identifying features of this turtle was its pelvis, which was a 90 centimeter wide pelvis. Wow. <laughs> so three feet wide. Yeah. It had two bulges on its front, which are identifying for it because they're unlike any other tur- turtle pelvis known to date. This goes back to what you were saying about how different body parts can be important. Yep. For this turtle, part of what identifies it is its weird hips. It has very unusual hips with two identifying bulges, two huh. bone protrusions. The shape and also other pubic processes, as well as histology cutting into the bone and looking at its structure all point to it being a marine pelagic turtle, so ocean water and open water. And while the estimation for the shell size would make it the second largest turtle we've ever known, the hip size suggests that it's probably close to the same size as Archelon. The biggest marine turtle. The biggest turtle we've ever discovered, which is 4.6 meters long and is a North American species. That's why it's from over here. That's why they specified that they don't get it. They didn't seem to get as big in the European waters as the North American because they were referencing Archelon. Yes. <laughs> like Archelon is just notably huge. At the very least, our record breaker that we have found so far. Yes. Far outstrips the European record breaker so far. Yeah. But the hips seem to suggest that they were probably about the same size. And that would make it at least one of the biggest, but definitely the second biggest turtle we've ever discovered. 
which is interesting because it indicates that gigantic marine turtles have evolved multiple times in distinct families. So that size category was reached by different groups of marine turtles in different parts of the world. They also mentioned uh, just some ideas as to what could have caused the large body size to evolve. Unique habitat conditions in that area, the European archipelago during the Cretaceous, could have been possible. They also note that just large size leads to reproductive success, so it could just be that getting big is good for letting you travel further like leatherbacks do today. Mm -hmm. And that it likely had similar diet to today's sea turtles that didn't seem to be uh, uh, notably different in that way. So it's probably very much like our large sea turtles today, just even bigger. It's interesting because it would lead you to think, eh, it doesn't have to be true, but it would lead us to suspect that that means there might have been something similar about the environments of the North American seaways and the Euro European seaways at that time to both give rise to these big sea turtles. Absolutely. But then again, the oceans back then and today are just full of all sorts of giant animals, so it doesn't even necessarily need to be that those two places were similar, just that they were ocean. Yep. And that when the opportunity arises, a turtle will get enormous. Yeah, that you had enough room to be that big. <laughs> well, congratulations, Europe, on your newly christened enormous marine turtle. <laughs> and with that, we can wrap up the news and start leading into our main discussion. Speaking of cool animals with armor all over them. I see, this time we will uh, segue. There's a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a bit about armadillos and what it means to be an armadillo. After the break. When I think of armadillos, I often think of cartoons because I feel like they have been cartoonified very, very often. That's true. Because armadillos are very unique animals. They're very distinctive. Nothing looks like an armadillo, really, unless you're an armadillo. Right. <laughs> like, I think of a boss from Donkey Kong 64 <laughs> whose name was Armadillo. Yes, yes. And he went, rah, 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 and he had <laughs> big jetpacks on his sides of his shell, and he'd curl up and he'd roll at you. That's what I think of when I think of armadillos. Nice. Also, osteoderms. Yes. Because those are fun. Armadillos are the armored like actually bony osteoderm armor and have their entire backs covered in this which is unique among mammals yeah when we think of osteoderms bone armor we've talked about this a bunch on the podcast crocodilians have that a bunch of lizards are really well covered in arm in osteoderm armor there are dinosaurs we've talked about with osteoderms but you don't typically see mammals with osteoderms at all, and especially not with extensive osteoderm armor. Yes, and today it is unique to armadillos. Nothing, mm -hmm. no mammalian animal alive today other than an armadillo has bony armor. So armadillos are notably weird among mammals, which is fitting because they are from a notably weird group. Xenarthrins are the group that armadillos are found within. This is your armadillos, your sloths, and your anteaters. Just the group with all the weird mammals. Yes. They get their own table at Thanksgiving. That's where all the weird mammals sit. Which makes sense, because they are one of the four major lineages of placental mammals. They broke off very early from other mammals, so they have stayed very different from other mammals. We've done one other episode on Xenarthrins. We had a sloths episode way back in episode 24. Absolutely. And there are some shared features across these groups. First off, the long claws is a feature of Xenarthrins. Long claws on their front limbs is a shared feature across this group, even if they're using them for different things. Right. Modern slots are climbing with those claws. Anteaters are digging into termite mounds and stuff. And armadillos, I'm sure we'll discuss, are excellent burrowers. Yes, they are. Though this group also has things like extra joints on their vertebrae, the connecting articulating points of their backbones have extra features that we don't see in other mammals. That's actually what Xenarthrin the name comes from that. Their limb bones are unusual compared to other mammals. One of the biggest things that is shared across them is their weird teeth. I was just going to say, you, you got to mention the teeth. Absolutely. They have, Xenarthran teeth are very lacking of bells and whistles compared to what you typically think of for a mammal tooth. They have 
no enamel, which is the hard outer surface of our teeth and mammal teeth in general, typically. Typically, they are homodont, which means they're basically all the same shape. Like, they don't have a lot of variety of teeth, you know, with molars, canines, incisor. It's just tooth, 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 tooth. And often are hypsodont, meaning high crowned, some of which have ever-growing teeth. Yeah. Open-rooted teeth. Teeth that don't have a root that adheres on the bottom. They just grow continuously. Yeah, so you, they just grind down their teeth as they chew, and they have different kinds of dentine, which is the interior of our teeth, that make up the inside and outside instead of enamel. They tend to just look like little pillars that with flat tops or little mounds, you know, little rounded bumps. Not very fancy, very simplistic. They're often considered the most primitive of mammal teeth, as the group is often considered very primitive when compared to other mammals, because a lot of their features are go back to more basal mammal features. Right. Primitive in the sense of ancient features that have just stuck around instead of being replaced or changed over the evolution of the group to the modern day. Exactly. Xenarthrins are broken up into two groups, the pilosa, which are your sloths and anteaters, and the cingulata, armadillos. And is that where we're sticking for the rest of this episode? That is where we will be. We will be within cingulata, which has more than just armadillos in it, but today is just armadillos. The surviving cingulata are all armadillos. There's roughly 21 species, which is notable because that makes this by far the most diverse group of xenarthrins. Oh, yeah. Armadillos make up 67% of living xenarthrins. Wow, because there's, what, two or three sloth species mm -hmm. alive today? And I don't actually know how many anteaters. Yeah, I guess I, not many. I can't remember, but yeah, not nearly as many as armadillos. Armadillos are very, very successful as far as xenarthrins go in the modern day, and they have been throughout history. The main feature that sets them apart are their osteoderms. That is the defining feature of cingulata. All armadillos have extensive dermal armor, skin armor, made out of hundreds of individual osteoderms. So it's not like one big shield. It is a shield made out of lots of little bones that makes it somewhat flexible. Which is actually very similar to other animals with osteoderms. Crocs have plates of armor all down the back. Armored lizards have plates, or sometimes they're pebbly. Sometimes they're like long rectangular sheets. Yep. So armadillos are very much like those reptiles in that respect. Absolutely. Now their armor does have specific sections. There's the cephalic shield, which covers the top of the head, mm -hmm. the carapace, which covers the body, and the caudal sheath, which covers the tail, and actually wraps around the tail. Yeah. Unless you're in the one group, which is the naked-tailed armadillos, huh. which don't have armor on the tail. The carapace can then be broken up further into three sections. The scapular and pelvic bucklers, which are the two more solid-looking parts at the front and back of the body. And then those are separated or connected by a series of bands, osteoderm belts, that vary in the number of belts. And this is what gives them more flexibility in their, their trunk section. I can picture it. When mm -hmm. you look at an armadillo and you've got that relatively solid-looking section of armor at the front of the body and that relatively solid, you know, quarter dome or whatever in the back. And then these rows in between that they kind of look like certain trilobites. Yeah, absolutely. They've got that kind of front shield, back shield and sectioned middle. Yeah. And the bands allow it to kind of act like the, the accordion section of an accordion or like if you think of a bendy section for a tube. Oh, that or has like a those. bendy straw. Yes. Mm-hmm. It allows them to move, and those bands are connected by flexible skin yeah. so that they can shift over and away from one another as the armadillo moves its body. Right. So it's not just a saw, it's not like a turtle shell. It can actually bend and flex. Absolutely. And those bucklers are also somewhat flexible. Like if, you, if you've ever gotten to hold an armadillo, you can kind of squeeze and they bend and move. They're tough, but they are not solid. The bones are not fused together. They are individual movable pieces, so you can get some more flexibility and maneuverability. This armor is also covered by keratinous scales, which is the same stuff our fingernails are made out of. That is the like, growing part on the outside, which they will like shed pieces of these and they will grow new ones. Another shared feature within Singulata is specialized forelimbs. They have very strong front limbs 
with modifications clearly adapted for digging. Now, not all armadillos are strict diggers or even active diggers, so the amount of digging each armadillo is doing does vary quite a bit. But they all do have very armadillo-shaped front limbs, which includes robust bones that resist twisting and bending, well-developed muscles that are thicker than your average mammal forelimb muscle, and short, compact feet with long claws on those front limbs. So those two things are pretty common across all of Cingulata, but definitely today's armadillos will all show that armor, sometimes minus the tail armor, mm -hmm. and front limbs that are strong with long claws. But there is still notable diversity within today's armadillos. Uh, they do differ quite a bit from species to species and group to group. Traditionally, all of armadillos were grouped under the Dazipodidae, but more recent studies and more typically you will see that split into two families, Dazipodidae and the Clamiphoridae, with one genus in the Dazipodidae, Dazipus. These are your long-nosed armadillos. And the Clamiphoridae has three subfamilies, the Euphractinae, which are your hairy armadillos, your six-banded armadillo, and the pixie armadillo. The Toliputinae, which includes your three-banded armadillos, your naked-tailed armadillos, and the giant armadillo. Ooh. And then the Clamphorinae, which are the two fairy armadillos. Oh, there are some cute armadillos yeah, out there. Yeah, there are. Now, by far, the largest genus is Dazipus. They're long-nosed armadillos. That's the one I've heard of. Yes. These are eight species within this one genus, so it is the most species-rich. It also has the largest distribution. They cover over... 19 million square kilometers from Argentina to North America. Oh, wow. So they are vastly distributed. And they include the most famous armadillo, which is the one that individually has the largest area, the nine-banded armadillo. Which is the one that I've heard of. Dazipus novum cinctus. This is the only armadillo that regularly makes it into the United States. This is the one that we up here are familiar yes. with. Yes, so if you're a North American, typically... The nine-banded armadillo is going to be the one you see most often. There are others that make it up into Central America mm -hmm. and, you know, I think even into Mexico, but the nine-banded is the only one that makes it into the States and actually only made it here relatively recently, like but, 19th century. I was going to say, that's a recent and, and from what I've heard, continuously moving north. Yes. They, in the 19th century, it made it across the Rio Grande into Mexico and was evidently introduced into Florida by humans around the same time. Oh, that makes sense. Yep. That's what Florida's for. And then since has spread as far north as Oklahoma and from New Mexico all the way to the East Coast. Wow. And is continuing to move north. There have been sightings in Virginia. They're, they're taking over. Absolutely. I've heard there have been sightings in Tennessee. Yes. Their rapid expansion has been explained partially by few natural predators in the U.S. and high reproductive rate. They have a very notable reproduction, which we'll go over in more detail in just a moment. But their expansion is very controlled because they do not handle harsh winters well. And this is an armadillo trait. Armadillos in general don't do well in the cold. Hmm. So I've heard it noted that you can actually watch armadillo, nine-banded armadillo populations move north and south with seasons. Huh. That they'll spread during summer and then winter will come in and kill off the <laughs> forward edge and bring it back down because... They don't have typically high body temperatures. They also lack insulating fat, large surface area because of that armor. Mm -hmm. They lose heat quickly and they don't hibernate. Oh, yeah. So they can't wait out the winters. They have to keep active and they end up dying during that cold time. But people have noted that with rising temperatures, it's very likely we will see increased territorial expansion yep. for the nine banded armadillo. So they are coming. Now, the nine-banded is an extensive burrower. Like, one animal can have 12 burrows. Ooh. And they're very good at high-speed digging. One of the defensive strategies that's often noted with them is that they actually are fairly good runners. You wouldn't think armadillos. You'd think they'd be clunky like a turtle, where it's, you know, I'm working around my shield. And they aren't graceful animals, but they can move. Mm -hmm. Like, I've watched armadillos run treadmill, like little uh, hamster wheels built for them. Yeah. And get it going. So they are not slow animals per se. They can run when they are feeling threatened. But if that fails, the nine-banded will often find a area, dig a trench, and then just huddle down in the trench. Just really quickly burrow in. Yep. And 
it's ar- it'll still be fully exposed, but only the armor. Right. And so the animal can't typically bite through the armor and can't get a hold on its smooth tail. And so they just hunker down and then wait for the animal to get bored <laughs> and leave. They often have the notable defense response of leaping. Yeah. Nine banded armadillos are well known for jumping straight up like three or four feet in the air. Yeah. That's a threat response. They just shoot up. Jackbox, hopefully to surprise the predator is the the typical wisdom. That would surprise me. Yep. But this makes them really prone to becoming roadkill. Yep. Because they cross a road, get scared by a car, and instead of going under it, which they very well would because they are not huge animals, Mm -hmm. they jump up into the grill of the car. Yep. So they are very common as roadkill, which is which is terrible. Very sad. They also have two super weird things that are unique to them and almost no other animals. One is they reproduce via obligate, so this is the only way they do it, polyembryony. Multiple embryos, nine bandits give birth to quadruplets every time. Oh yeah, I have heard that. Mm-hmm. Now, this is something that happens in other animals. You know, we can have twins and triplets and quadruplets. Sure. Basically, any other mammal can do that, but those are typically rarities that Mm -hmm. we weren't meant to reproduce that way. It just happened. It was a chance. Armadillos, they have a reproductive style that always splits one embryo into multiple identical embryos. Weird. In mammals, at least as far as I could find, it's only been found in six species of armadillos, all in Dazipus. Mm -hmm. So this is almost a feature of this genus, but not quite. And they do vary. The 12 banded armadillo gives birth to octuplets. Wow, every time? Every time. Wow. And it said that 12 embryos form, but typically only 7 to 8 are born. Huh. So it, they form many, but so, only give birth to a portion. Wow. The greater long nose armadillo gives twins every time, mm-hmm. and the nine banded gives quadruplets, four babies. Fascinating. Now, the process by this happening means they form one zygote, and then that zygote splits, and then splits again. And they get four. There is the evolutionary question of why. Why do this? And I found a couple of responses. One is that they do have some unique features to their reproductive systems. One is they have an unusually small uterus, which may mean that they can only initially form one zygote in the uterus. And then when it moves to a larger area, it can split. So it may be a way to combat the low reproductive rates that a small uterus would traditionally mm-hmm. limit you to yeah. and let you have more babies. Let you have a litter. Yes. But there are there's other evidence that seems to show that that's not necessarily the reasoning, that they have a premature development of the placenta. The membrane develops large early on, which then can be split more easily. So it may just be that they they make a large placental membrane, which is easily split into quadruplets. So we're not sure evolutionarily why they do this and what the origins of this exactly is, but this is a feature of this group. The nine-banded is also the only non-human mammal known to carry leprosy. Yes, very famous thing about armadillos. Very famous. Leprosy, Hansen's disease, which is spread by a bacteria, Microbacterium leperi, is a very serious infectious disease, well known throughout human history. Mm Mm-hmm. Armadillo, the nine-banded armadillo specifically, only this species, to my knowledge and from what I found, is the only other mammal that can carry and transmit leprosy. Now, whether or not it can transmit to humans has been debated. They can definitely transmit to each other, just like we can transmit to another human if we have it. But there has been some evidence of new cases of leprosy that seem to be traced back to nine-banded armadillos. Hmm. So they are very heavily studied for this fact. Yeah, as potential vectors of this otherwise somewhat rare disease. Exactly. You'll see nine-banded armadillos as education animals at zoos and aquariums a lot of time, and that question will come up. And just because they can be carriers, they do not automatically have it, which is a common misconception that right. they carry leprosy. Well, it's like rabies. Yes. Not every wild animal has rabies, but rabies is bad enough that if you're bitten by a wild animal, you go get that dealt with exactly so you do have to test nine band armadillos for leprosy to make sure they're not carrying it yeah and you have to be aware of that potential medical risk now there is one thing i have not mentioned which is the next most famous thing about armadillos which is them rolling up into balls yeah and that's because nine bandits don't do that huh basically no armadillo does that huh only three banded armadillos do that huh which is two species 
in Totally Putinus is the genus of the three banded armadillos, which, as the name suggests, they have three bands between the shields instead of the nine or the twelve or the six or the seven. Yep. <laughs> this is an identifying feature of many of the species of the different number of bands. Yeah. Three banded armadillos are the only ones who roll into balls. That is not an armadillo feature. That is a this genus feature. Wow, but it's such an unusual and interesting and dramatic feature that common perception has assigned it to armadillos in general. Yeah, because well, if you're going to make a cartoon armadillo... Yeah, well, let's like, give it the superpower yes. that's the best one. <laughs> if it can, Why would you not have it be able to pill bug, you know, roly poly up Yeah, if you're going to put an armadillo in your thing? So these are two species, relatively small. You know, these are smaller species, not the smallest, but they can roll up into completely closed balls. Like, they don't just roll up a little bit. It is, you wouldn't be able to get your fingers between the gaps of the shields. Mm -hmm. And the tail and the head fit together like locks. They also noted that a lot of times they won't close up all the way. And then will close completely when you, like, go to investigate. Right, they're keeping an eye out. Yeah, and it's thought that that might also be a way to try to s scare you. You know, oh, like, if I go to put my nose in there, I snap on your nose. Mm -hmm. Or I snap in your face and I, you get surprised back. Because they can roll up fast. There's that yeah. famous gift that you'll find of one that's standing and rolls up so quickly it goes airborne for a second <laughs> <Yep>. and falls. <laughs> These are also notable that they are not diggers. Hmm. They don't burrow, really. You'll find them in burrows, but it's typically pre-existing burrows from everything I've learned. And they don't burrow even to forage. They're doing most of their activity on the surface, even though they still have long claws. And they'll still, like, move stuff out of the way with those claws. Right, they could be digging. Yes. But they're not active burrowers. Hmm. And part of the thinking is that they may not need to be. Why, why hide... Yeah. When you can just roll up. When you can become fully armored. Yes. You just close shop. No reason to make a home when you can just carry it with you. They're also fun because when they walk, they actually walk on the claws of their front feet. They don't put their palms down. They can't. They walk on the claw tips hmm. in this kind of little tiptoed looking way. On the flip side of that, you have the fairy armadillos, which are subterranean almost. Like these are more like moles in their behavior. They spend most of their time underground. There are two species of fairy armadillos, and they are the smallest armadillos, with their weights being around 100 grams. <laughs> Itty bitty. They also have different, their shields don't look the same as your typical armadillo, where they don't have the big front and the big back with few bands in the middle. It looks like it's mostly bands when you take a glance at it, so it doesn't have the same shape, and it's much more just on the top of the back, like they're furry on the sides. They're not encapsulated by their armor. They have a number of features that point to them being fossorial, you know, living underground, a long torpedo-shaped body, reduced eyes. They have a vertical round plate that caps their butt <laughs> so that nothing can come in behind them and grab them. And they're extremely elusive. Like, we don't know a lot about their behavior because they're subterranean, living underground, and nocturnal. And tiny. And tiny. So, like, they're doing everything they can to be hard for us to easily observe. <laughs> And their habitats and ranges are under attack, so they're, at least the larger species is in decline, or at least threatened. There's also some local perceptions of them as bad luck that has also led to their number declines. Mm. And they are not the only tiny armadillo. The peachy armadillo, or dwarf armadillo, is also quite small, though not nearly as tiny as them. 700 to 1,000 grams, or 1,500 grams. So these get up to a few pounds. But they are notable because of one thing they have that other armadillos don't. They live in Argentina, but range up to altitudes of 2,500 meters, which gets quite dry and cold. Mm -hmm. And they can hibernate. Oh. They are the only armadillo that's been noted, I think mostly in human care, but that has been noted of hibernation or at least torpor. So suspended low activity. They burrow as well, which can help with the cold, you know, going down underground to maintain a stable temperature and they'll even seal their burrows to close it in but they still have to go up to forage and aren't going to be able to avoid the temperatures then and they will go through daily periods of torpor of lowered body activity to survive those harsher times and they're the only armadillo noted to do this so even that rule is not completely consistent across the whole group yeah and then the final one i wanted to mention was the giant armadillo which is the largest living singula cingulate and can reach 150 centimeters long. So getting up to five feet long 
and weigh 50 kilograms or 110 pounds. Wow. Hefty armadillo. That's a big armadillo. They've got massive claws on the front feet. <laughs> like, now I'm picturing an anteater. Yeah, basically big, big claws on the front feet. These claws can reach up to 20 centimeters long, Whew. which I saw mentioned in one thing, at least that these are potentially one of the largest proportionately for a mammal. Yeah, that would make sense. I believe it. These are huge for their body. They are also particularly rare. They have a large range over 11 different countries in South America, but their habitats are smaller, it seems, and they are not super active and are endangered, mm. So, or at least vulnerable. So we don't know a ton about their behavior, but they are also diggers and seem to also be nocturnal and can actually dig large burrows because they are big and potentially makes them important environmental engineers, oh, you know, yeah. reshaping their environment. But we don't know all the extents of how much of an effect they have since we don't have a ton of understanding about these Right, right. Mysterious animals. I can imagine that a five foot long burrower is going to create lots of habitat space. Oh, yeah. Other things that like to get inside burrows. Absolutely. And you're digging up and churning up the earth. Mm -hmm. And if your burrows collapse, that's going to change the surface. Like you're reshaping literally the land, which also leads us nicely into the wider diversity of cingulates, the extinct groups. This is the largest cingulate today. Yes. Today, as you mentioned armadillos are all that we have of this group and just to put a little bow on what you were just going over surprisingly diverse yes but not all armadillos fit the model in my brain of what an armadillo is absolutely some are hairier than others some are basically not haired at all yeah, their behavior and lifestyles are quite different but they used to be so much more diverse. That, that this group has a whole lot of stuff that isn't around anymore today and there used to be a ton of diversity of armadillos, which we will talk about later in the episode, but also groups within Singulata that we have lost completely today. The two big ones are pampatheres and glyptodonts. These were cingulates that were extremely common from the Miocene to the latest Pleistocene, but their fossil record goes back basically to the beginning of cingulates as well. Glyptodonts are probably the most famous of these yeah. since... If, they are, if you're a fan of Ice Age stuff, yeah. you've almost certainly seen glyptodonts in art and things. These are very characteristic ancient mammals in that nothing looks like a glyptodont but a glyptodont. They had body armor like an armadillo, but it was a hard fused shell, much yeah. more like a turtle. I have most commonly heard and read glyptodonts compared to Volkswagen beetles. Yes. It looks, it is roughly the shape and, and rigidity <laughs> of a small car <laughs> yes these were large mammal they got big and unlike most other cingulates their shell was immobile it was fused rigid as you said yeah it, it looks like they're wearing an igloo yes made of bone on their back and it was still made of individual osteoderms but these had fused into one solid structure right. more like a turtle shell exactly right? a turtle shell is many different pieces that fuse together this is in comparison to pampatheres, which have features both similar to armadillos and glyptodonts. They were also large and also are herbivorous, which glyptodonts were large herbivores. They also have similar things in like the thickness and size of their osteoderms. So like the anatomy of their osteoderms is more similar to a glyptodont and their jaw and even inner ear was more similar, but their shape and the anatomy of their shell was more like an armadillo they had the carapace divided into the two bucklers and the bands hmm. so it's sectioned out like an armadillo their anatomy of their limbs is more like an armadillo's and their head is more shaped like an armadillo so they look like a big armadillo with more glyptodon osteoderms and diet and, and uh, other specific features which made their placement within the group very difficult for a long time. Like, there's supporting morphological evidence for either group. This is because traditionally, Singulata was separated between the Desipoididae and the Glyptodontidae. Those were the two families of cingulates. Mm -hmm. Now, with more recent molecular studies, the cingulates have been split into the Desipoids and the, the Clamiphorids, and typically, Glyptodonts place out either close to the, the Clamiphorids or within that family. 
So whereas previously it was thought there is an armadillo lineage and a glyptodon lineage, now more recently evidence seems to suggest that glyptodonts are part of one of the armadillo lineages. Exactly. That they are, and I've seen this shift Mm -hmm. in recent years of paleontologists moving from calling glyptodonts like ancient armadillos to just calling them giant armadillos. Absolutely. That they seem to not have been something similar, but like so many Ice Age things, a giant member of a group we still have today. Which is really interesting because the specific group that they fall out closest to are actually the fairy armadillos in some studies. (laughs) Which would be notable because those are both highly derived, very different A mole-shaped armadillo and a giant tank turtle-shaped armadillo, which speaks even further to the diversity potential of this group. Pampathiers were originally debated whether they were with armadillos or with glyptodonts, and for a long time you would find glyptodontinae with glyptodonts and Mm pampathiers. In a lot of older studies, that's how they will be described. With other more recent studies placing them closer to armadillos... Nowadays, what I most commonly found was that Pampathiers is its own lineage, separate from those two armadillo lineages. Yeah. So you have Pampathiers and armadillos, and then armadillo splits, and one of those has glyptodonts. Right. There are some notable similarities between these two large cingulates. Both were herbivorous, but they did it in slightly different ways. Uh, Pampathiers had jaws more similar to like a cow's, where they were able to chew side to side. Mm -hmm. Powerful, grinding jaws likely for grazing, you know, eating field vegetation, grass and stuff like that. Glyptodonts also seem to be herbivores. They're actually named for their deeply grooved teeth. And one of the things that was really weird is they don't choose side to side, but rather back to forward, it seems. Oh, weird. Grinding your jaw, like jetting your jaw forward and pulling it back. And it's been debated whether they were more browsers or grazers. Uh, One study looked at isotope values of carbon and oxygen to see which type of plant they were most likely eating. And they found a mixture of C3 and C4 plants, but with high consumption of C4 and comparison with values of horses and mastodons and mammoths and tapers, a a variety of grazing and browsing animals. It seems like they were likely living in open habitats, also grazing. Okay. So both of these were probably giant armored lawnmowers. (laughs) And big, like these got very large. The largest pampathiers get up to 200 or 225 kilograms, 440 to 500 pounds. These are going to be your later species that showed up more recently, which is also true of glyptodons, but they got real big. Enormous. Dodocurus is often cited as one of, if not the largest glyptodon. They were around uh, like 85,000 years ago. And one of the most recent known, like they're one of the last that was around. And they probably weighed between 1,900 or 2,300 kilograms, which he's getting up to 4,500 pounds. Yeah, almost 5,000 pounds. And we're reaching sizes of one and a half meters, five feet tall, and lengths of 3.6 meters, 12 feet long. Massive animals. Actually the size and weight of cars. Yes. These were huge, like large, even for herbivore size. Yeah, that's a rhino-sized armadillo. And just this, just for a, a little random tidbit to really even make them weirder, the studies on their limbs show that it should be that even the largest of glyptons should have been able to stand on its back feet at least for a period. Huh. Partially counterbalanced by their long tails, potentially for mating. That would make sense. Is the thought. Sure, sure. But yeah, mechanically, it seems like they should have been able to raise up, which is horrifying. (laughs) That's that's terrifying. (laughs) Speaking of those long tails, we've mentioned Glyptodon tails a number of times Mm -hmm. in Tails episode and with Stegosaurs. It's come up that they were one of the groups that created tail weapons. Yes, one of the very few groups of animals Mm -hmm. that have had weaponized tails. And... A number of glyptons were noted to create the caudal tube where they formed a fused bones in the tail to make a long baseball bat kind of shape. Yeah, so the osteoderms actually surround the whole tail to create these rings that go down the length of the tail. And many of them would have them fused and the bones of the tail fused to make a rigid structure. Mm -hmm. 
Dodicarus is famous for being the one that expanded it into a spiked mace tip. Yeah, so basically Ice Age ankylosaurs. Yep, almost certainly used for defense, but some evidence of damage on the carapace and the thickness of the carapace of Glyptodonts suggests that it likely was for competition as well. Yeah, they were bashing each other with them. Yep. <laughs> Which is interesting because that would also drive the evolution of those big, rigid, thick, armored shells. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to start ramming each other, you might as well become more tank-like. Yes. <laughs> both to survive and take on the other guy. And especially if you're using those kinds of combats for territory or mating or these things that are really key to surviving and passing on these traits to the next generations. Yeah. Back to our conversations about sexual selection. Once sex gets involved in a trait, it can, tends to take off. Oh, yeah. Now, this is not the entirety of the extinct diversity of this group, but we'll talk more about that after the break, and we'll go through the history of Singulata and how they've changed and some of the diversity they've shown over time. All right. Now to go over the history of cingulates. The deep history. The deep history. Let's start with the origins of Xenarthra, because there are some important features that are shared with the group. Now this superorder, as we mentioned, is one of the main lineages of placental mammals. This, again, is your sloths, anteaters, armadillos, and everything else that has been part of that lineage over time. And they were one of the earliest branching placental mammal lineages like they go back to roughly 70 67 million years ago so in the cretaceous still that they branched off from other mammals and became their own distinct clade and have since then been south american basically up until south american north american connected xenarthra has been a south american group so almost all of their fossil history happens on there on one continent yes we talked a bit about the that unusual history of that continent in episode 74 absolutely so this sense of isolationism being contained on one landmass is part of what led to them being such a distinct group right they're weird not because they are weird but because they're different from all the things that we're more familiar with exactly because they were alone <laughs> yes. evolving and then coming back and going Wait, you all weren't doing this? <laughs> well, they got to North America and went, what is all this weird stuff? Why, why are your claws so small? Why are your teeth so bizarre? Now, one of the features that is thought to probably be either ancestral or at least very close to the ancestry of Xenarthrans is digging. It's thought that that is probably a shared feature across the group, even though it's only really noted still in armadillos. Right. Like, we don't have burrowing anteaters even though they are still digging with their claws into anthills and termite mounds armadillos are the only ones who still seem to be fossorial but it's thought that that feature may go back to at least close to the beginning of xenarthrans if not the ancestor of xenarthrans another important note on their limb bones might give a clue to who their close relatives are there are features that might connect them to a group called the paleodonts which was an early group of small fossorial mammals with reduced teeth, reduced yeah. dentition. Fossorial means digging, by the way, everybody. Yes. In case you uh, aren't familiar with that term. So this could potentially be an anc the ancestral group, or at least relatives of the ancestral group of Xenarthrans. There have also been links between paleodonts and the Folidota penguins. Oh, that makes sense, kind of yeah. intuitively. So there may be a link between Xenarthrans and penguins, but not for sure. That's, yeah. that's a maybe. Uh, as far as I understand it, which I don't understand much, but I think that pangolins have bounced all around yeah. the mammal family tree as we've tried to figure out where they go, uh, which sounds like a subject for a hypothetical future pangolins episode. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the current grouping puts xenarthrans as a sister group to Afrotheria. Afrotheria, which includes elephants and manatees yes. and, and all the this big, big group that originates in Africa. Exactly. At least last I read the members of Afrotheria. Yes, now, one feature that has been debated as to whether or not it is ancestral to the group or not is osteoderms. Right. Which is important to note, since that's the key feature of being a cingulate. Right, those armor bones, which 
armadillos and their relatives have, but we also discussed in episode 24 that ancient sloths also would commonly have osteoderms. Absolutely. Now, they never had a shield like armadillos do. Right. But they definitely had bone in their skin, in their hide. Patches of armor mm-hmm. within the skin. So it may have been more like chain mail or, or you know, scale mail where you have a looser fitting of armor than a solid connected shield. So that's brought up the question is, was this common to Xenarthrans and then lost in all but the singulates? Mm-hmm. Or was this a feature that was evolved twice? Once in singulates and once in some groups of ground sloths. Considering how rare they seem to be among, like, not even all ground sloths have been identified to have had this feature. Yeah. Only certain groups, like megatheres, are the main ones, and I think only a couple have been noted. That rarity probably suggests that it was evolved simultaneously, convergently. You know, in both groups, not lost in sloth, most sloths. Hmm. That it is not ancestral to Xenarthrans, but probably separate evolutions. Which is interesting, because given how rare it is among mammals in general, that would tempt me to guess that it would have been Mm -hmm. ancestral in Xenarthrans, because the thought of it evolving multiple times just seems odd to think about. So maybe there is something about Xenarthrans that made it easier to evolve. You know, there's something about their genetics made that... Or the structure of their skin or something... But I and I didn't find any like this is what we think, but that that seems to be where the research tends to lean. Interesting is that it was they are separate features, but osteoderms are incredibly important to discuss when we talk about the fossil record of cingulates because they are highly identifiable. Yes, most fossil cingulate species are identified by their osteoderms. This is actually true of a lot of groups of animals that have osteoderms. Yes. That osteoderms are really useful for identifying, partially because they fossilize really well, because they are little chunks of armor bone. Yeah, of dense bone. (laughs) And animals tend to have lots of them. But also that, yeah, oftentimes lizard groups can be distinguished by the shape of their osteoderms. And that's true of armadillos and cousins. Absolutely. Which means that cingulates have a very good fossil record especially compared to other xenarthrans. Mm-hmm. So not only are they the most diverse today, but we have a better understanding of them and better record of them in the past because of this armor. Fossil cingulates make up over 100 genera throughout their history. With I found a listing that said 35 genera of armadillos and pampatheres, and in other things saying that there are seven genera of pampatheres. So roughly those together made about 35-ish. And like 65 to 68 genera of glymptodons. Wow. Like those, they did very well, even though they are extinct now. When they were around, glymptodons were very successful. These osteoderms are also very informative based on their anatomy. Cingulate osteoderms are different from other vertebrate osteoderms. They have a complex internal structure and association with the soft tissues of the skin. Mm. With having structures to allow for hair, skin glands like sweat glands, bone marrow, blood vessels, and nerves. So the structure of their osteoderms are more complex, at least for soft tissue features, than your typical reptilian osteoderm. So when you cut into one of their osteoderms and look at the internal structure, you can get info about that, which has been used to link to things like their habitat. And a fossil record full of osteoderms is just all kinds of useful. Right? Now, as far as when Singulata became its own group from the other Xenarthrans, that probably also goes back toward the beginning of Xenarthra. I saw dates about 66 million years ago, so right at the barrier between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene. And in fact, the earliest known fossil Xenarthran, so the estimates put the origin for Xenarthra at the end of the Cretaceous, but the actual first fossil of a Xenarthran is an armadillo, or at least a cingulate. Huh. Rio Stegotherium, which is from the early Eocene of Brazil and Argentina, that are known from some material including some potentially forelimb elements. Some arm bones. Some arm bones. Is the earliest armadillo, you know, ish. Like within that lineage. Yep. For the purposes of this episode, we're yeah. using armadillo to mean the whole of the Singulata lineage. Yep. Your mileage may vary depending on who you talk to. Absolutely. Most of the papers would call these armadillos. So like the abstracts for a lot of these called it an armadillo. And this is the first armadillo and the earliest 
bone evidence of xenarthrins. Cool. So armadillos are also one of the earliest xenarthrins in the fossil record. Yeah, which uh, makes sense given what we've just said about the fossil record of this group. Precisely. Another very early skeletal material of this group from Patagonia, uh, from early Eocene, is Utetus, included some lower mandible and had tin peg-like cylindrical, very armadillo teeth. Hmm. This, though, still remain still retained enamel on the tooth. Oh, which so, they don't have today. Yeah, so that might have been a feature that was lost as the lineage went on. And then when we hit the middle Eocene is when we see armadillos start to really diversify. So they started diversifying fairly early in their lineage. Yeah, this is 40 million years ago or so. And we start seeing some weird armadillo. Like, I always like to note when it's like, they got weird early, they were doing well. During this time, we see the largest dazipoded armadillo, which is the group that includes the long nose and the nine banded. Right, the most common modern group of armadillos. The largest of those shows up at this time, Macro Euphractus, and had a skull of nearly 28 centimeters long, so almost a foot long head, Mm -hmm. and a body that would have been about two meters long. Oh, wow. So this was a good bit bigger than today's giant armadillo, and has features that mean it might have been carnivorous, or at least more specialized for a carnivorous diet, which today, most armadillos are insectivorous or omnivorous generalists right right they'll eat a little bit of everything eggs small animals you'll see uh, you find pictures of them eating like little lizards or something Mm -hmm. so this one might have been more of a meat eater the second upper molar was more cananiform more canine shaped pointed yes and this was not the only eocene armadillo that had teeth that suggested a diet like this another genus lumber ethereum also a dazipoted from argentina had somewhat heterodont teeth, different shaped teeth with a cananiform first tooth and even a diastema, a gap between the canine shaped and the other more molar shaped teeth. Which we see in a lot of animals today. And potentially uh, teeth with closed roots, so not the open root, potentially ever growing teeth. So there were some large and some potentially carnivorous, you know, meat specialists, armadillos. Cool. But by far the weirdest of this time are the horned armadillos. Horned armadillos. Yep. We mentioned these briefly in the horns episode. Episode 140. The Peltophilidae was a group of armadillo-like animals. These are often grouped outside of the true armadillos, but close to them. So you'll hear them called horned armadillos. These were around from the early Eocene to the late Miocene, but they're only really well known from the Miocene, so they're so early. much later than this time we're, exactly. we're currently been talking about. But they showed up around this time, so they diversified with the rest of these diverse armadillos, but uh, we only have isolated osteoderms from their early history. They had short, broad skulls. The armor on top, that cephalic shield, had two horn-like protrusions over the nose. No, so it wasn't the bone of the skull, but the bone of the armor yeah. made two little horn bumps. Was it like side by side? Yep. Like a lot of the rhino relatives we talked about in episode 129. Yes, side by side, not front and back. And I saw one note it on the mandible, on their jaw potentially, huh. but I didn't find any examples of that to know what they meant by yeah. that. But the common pictures you'll see are two little side by side horns, very short, mm-hmm. on the tip of the snout. Because, listen, if you're covered in armor, you might as well make it spiky. Why not? These also had what were called beveled slicing teeth and the shorter muzzles. So also might have been more flesh eating, huh? more meat eating carnivorous armadillo cousins. Cool. Uh, they were so weird that when they were first described, uh, one person described them as ferocious beasts, carnivorous like a tiger and armored with horns like a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just a meat-eating rhinoceros. But more recent research has shown that they probably had more generalistic diets than sure. was initially suggested, that they were not <laughs> hunting armadillos, but probably ate a bit more meat than your sure. average armadillo today. Right, right. They weren't rolling down hills and then unfurling themselves to impale their prey upon yes. their nose spikes. <laughs> and we talked a bit in that Horns episode about what thought, the thought of the purpose of those horns might have been. And digging has been suggested, as it was for the the horned rodents that have had those side-by-side horns on the snout. The horned gophers, Mm ceratogallus. 
but I don't know that there's a ton of that. Like the papers that looked into that have not found direct support for that. Right. And also when in doubt display. Yep. It could absolutely <laughs> be display. And while this group has typically been considered to be its own lineage, there has been some studies that might group it closer to modern armadillo lineages. So it may be more closely related and just a very weird, distinct group. And some of the groups it's been linked to also show slightly more tendencies toward carnivory in modern armadillos. Interesting. So, so maybe that's still being worked out and debated, I'm sure. It is also thought of that about 42 million years ago is when the two lineages of our modern armadillos split. Uh, our Dazipus lineage and our everybody else with the fairy armadillos and the three bands and all them. Absolutely. Now, one notable thing I found about their fossil record is the oldest skulls for cingulates aren't found until the late Oligocene, about 25 to 26 million years ago. So actual head material. So most of it's been some body, at least a jaw was mentioned, and lots of osteoderms. But we don't get actual skulls until much later. And these include uh, a couple of species of cingulate, as well as a species of the peltophyllids, the horned armadillos. And once again, are the oldest well-preserved cranial remains of Xenarthra. Makes sense. <laughs> so again, the cingulates are the first for this, their overall group in the fossil record. And it's here about where we reach the Miocene, where we see a lot of diversification across the group. This is where a lot of famous fossils are known from. We do see other potentially carnivorous armadillos. Prosadius, which has features very similar to the pygmy armadillo today. So it would have been a smaller, but still seems to be more meat-eating. But then we have some other diets show up. Stegotherinae, a subfamily from the later Miocene, had what seemed to be very specialized in insectivorous skulls with long heads and very reduced cheek teeth, much more like an anteater. So we start seeing some specializations in diets. This is also when we see glyptodons start getting bigger, that we start seeing the large glyptodons show up. And notably, glyptodons get larger over time, with glyptodons during the early Miocene, the four genera known, are typically just a bit more than 100 kilograms or so. So just little glyptodons. Yeah. Only 200 pounds. Nothing to worry about. By the middle Miocene is when we start seeing the much larger during the Miocene is when they sh increase in size, where we also see a shift in the jaw anatomy, which suggests that they were shifting habitats and diet specializations to their grazing lifestyle. And so the largest glyptodons are found from starting at the late Miocene and through the end of their time, we see the largest Glyptodons. That's the last five million years or so. Yep. The Miocene comes up a lot in discussions like this. This is around 20 million to about five million years ago was a time of exceptional diversification in a lot of modern mammal groups. Absolutely. This was a time of a lot of change and a lot of things reached their recognizable state during this time period. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And there's a number of reasons why we could see them increasing in size. You know, that could be competition with other herbivores and interaction with predators, especially in their later history where they are interacting with new herbivores and new predators. Because as we mentioned in our great American biotic interchange episode, episode 43, not quite 3 million years ago, North America and South America connected with the Isthmus of Panama and allowed animals and plants to come North and South between continents that had been separated for millions and millions of years. Yeah, this is when we up here in North America got our Xenarthrans for the first time. Exactly. Like ground sloths around this time, we get glyptodonts, we get armadillos. Mm -hmm. Also things like possums and stuff. But then, of course, on the other hand, we in North America sent down dogs and bears and cats and all sorts of things that hadn't been down there before. And they're thinking that that very well could be one of the things that drove the extreme sizes at the end of the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. The Pleistocene is really when you see those 2,000 kilogram, you know, multi-thousand pound... The truly enormous glyptodons. This included Doodicarus, genus Glyptodon, 
as well as a few others that got to those massive sizes or thereabouts. Yeah, so it's a time period where you've got increased carnivore presence. Also, a lot of other animals are getting bigger, including the carnivores. Mm -hmm. And throughout this whole time period that we're seeing these giant glyptodons was also a time of general cooling of global climate. Yes. And as we've discussed before, when it's colder, things get bigger. So there's all these factors that could be driving larger and larger sizes in these big armored herbivores. Absolutely. And glyptodonts, as well as pamphetheres, are major players during this interchange, during the Gabby interchange, because they were the major cingulates to actually invade North America. You know, as we mentioned, the nine-banded armadillo only made it up here in North America recently mm -hmm. uh, during human history. But during the actual biotic interchange, it was glyptodonts and pamphetheres that we were seeing actually successfully invade North America and thrive there. The first cingulate known in Mexico are from pamphetheres, actually. Genus Pampatherium. This is in the lower Pliocene, so right before the full connection and typically Gabby is sighted. So they may have island jumped or crossed slightly before things were fully connected, which we know sloths did and we know a number of animals did. This is dated between like 4.8 to 4.7 million years ago. There's a couple of species that are still mostly South American, but Pampatherium mexicanum was the only North American species at that time. And later on, we see the genus Homsina, which became the true North American Pampathir. Mm -hmm. This is the genus that's really known from North America and actually spread out into upper, you know, not like northern North America, but above Mexico. There were still species known from South America. Uh, there's around seven species of this genus known. But it's possible that it first evolved in North America and re-invaded South America. Oh, interesting. Because when we look at the ones in South America, the youngest species are very similar, suggesting recent arrival, not that they started there. So the first truly North American pamphetheer. Which is an interesting and important note about the Great American Biotic Interchange, the Gabby is that it wasn't just things south moving north and things north moving south. There was a compl complex history yes. of bouncing around this connected area because the plants and animals at that time did not consider North and South America endpoints. It was just more land to live in. Exactly. This genus is notable not only for being the the major North American pamphetheer. Like, we see multiple species across North America, one which seems to have evolved in Florida. So they weren't only doing well here, but speciating here. They also were big. They're often noted as one of the largest pamphetheres, around 225 kilograms or 500 pounds at two meters long, so six feet. But there's also some notable fossils from them. I found one note of a complete fetus from Holmesina, which gave them some info about the potential growth rate. Their estimations for the fetus was at 12 kilograms, 26 pounds. Wow. It's a big baby. Yeah. <laughs> for a big animal, makes sense. But studying the size of the fetus and estimations for adults, uh, getting an idea for growth rate suggests a particularly fast growth rate. Makes sense. So they might have been growing very quick to get that big. Yeah. Were there three other embryos clustered right. tightly around it? <laughs> I didn't see any mention, <laughs> but man, would that be cool. Just you know, glyptodonts and pamphetheres being born in groups. Yes, just copy and pasted. Just, just clone groups. There was also one study that found lesions in the osteoderms of this, spe of this genus that seemed to be flea lesions. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we even have some pathology. Some evidence of what bugged the pamphetheres. Yes, and so uh, this group just seems to be important on a number of levels for our, our understanding of this group, which is cool. Yeah, sometimes when we talk about groups like this, I personally sort of informally measure how popular and common and famous the groups are in terms of paleontological study by what names I know. Yep. So, Homzina, I know. I know yes. that name. I've heard it discussed quite a bit because I have studied under a lot of Ice Age paleontologists. <laughs> yep. And th this is one of the major, important, well-studied North American Ice Age mammals. Yeah. And so like, if you Google Pampathir and just go to image search, 
home Xena is often the one that's going to come back for your artistic reconstructions and the if they're going to show you a skeleton it's probably this one not only because it is well known and famous and but and also big. it's big yeah and the biggest species <laughs> are typically the ones that are going to come up first right like i've heard of glyptodon of course mm-hmm. and i've heard of dedicurus yep but most of the other names you've mentioned are news to me yes now, Glyptodons also made it to North America quite famously. They're another famous North American Ice Age species. They made it a little bit later. First ones found in Mexico are about 3.9 to 2.8 million years old. So still early in the Gabby, but Pampatheers beat them here. Sure. And sloths. Yes. And they are also limited to one truly North American genus, Glyptotherium. Right. I've oh. heard of that one too. Yes. Which is likely a close relative of Glyptodon. Mm-hmm. And Glyptotherium, much like Homzina, did well. They were spread as far north as Oklahoma and all the way to the eastern seaboard, much like the nine banded armadillo yeah, today. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> and there were at least two species one older species from Mexico and one younger species from Texas. Oh. Which also sounds very familiar, like with the Pampatheers. Exactly. So they were, once again, speciating here in North America. Yeah. I've also seen evidence of potential sexual dimorphism noted in Glyptotherium. So that might be something that we could expect from that species. The main differences were the anatomy of lateral, so the osteoderms on the side and toward the back. Okay. Interesting. I wonder if that's where they were hitting each other with their mace tails. Yeah, or if there was something about mating that allowed for different positions. Yeah. You know, you see that with turtle shells. Yes. The different shapes between males and females, which aid with the mating movements and stacking yeah. on top of each other. It helps facilitate mounting. Yes. There are some notable things about the glyptodons and pamphetheers that made it here to North America. Both seem to have been potentially prone to more humid environments you know, wetter environments noting the anatomy of their jaws and teeth and what diet it was likely they had but glyptotherium many of the fossil sites where it's known from also contain capybaras oh which are today's largest rodent that is a semi-aquatic rodent yeah so it's likely that they were at least associated with aquatic habitats if not you know getting in the water interesting and glyptotherium was another one of the large Glyptodonts, not quite as large as Glyptodon, but getting up there. And there is evidence that they were hunted by humans here in North America, as we have evidence on the shells that we at least fed on them, whether or not we killed them. Mm -hmm. We definitely seem to have eaten (laughs) Glyptodonts, Glyptotherium. Humans certainly overlapped with, which I think just a a short pause, Mm -hmm. humans overlapped with Glyptodonts. Yep. Very interesting. Like, if we could, Assassin's Creed style, tap into (laughs) human memory, there would be memories of these monsters. And I believe that early uh, North American humans looked at a glyptodont and went, we'll eat that. Yeah, that's sure. (laughs) Surely whatever they're protecting has got to be tasty. (laughs) If you're going to work that hard to defend it. We've seen coconuts. We know what's inside there. But they probably hadn't seen coconuts. Yeah, no, true. With these, yeah, no, these people. They, they might not have. Yeah, it depends. I guess it depends on where you are. <laughs> these are big walnuts. Avocados. But then, as with most mammal groups, when we reach the end of the Pleistocene, we see the Glyptodonts and Pampatheers go extinct and most of the diversity of Singulata go extinct. Yeah, well, we've talked about this before and we did a whole episode, episode 25. Sure did. At the end of the Pleistocene, we lose a lot of our megafauna, our big animals. And Xenarthrans in general are a group that gets hit quite hard by this. Like They were a successful, widespread, diverse group. And now they are very species poor. Like there's not many species of a lot of the groups. Mm -hmm. And most have been pushed back down to South America. And we lost the entire lineages, Mm -hmm. giant ground sloths outside of Singulata, and then within Pampatheers and Glyptodonts. Exactly. And of course, there's the typical debate as to how much was climate or how much were we to blame. Right, we're we're ancient human Mm -hmm. activity. But we already know that Singulates are very responsive to climate shifts. Yes. Because today we see that they are often limited to their habitats by how harsh a winter they can handle. And it sounds like they 
uh, from what you were saying, they didn't make it particularly far north, Mm -mm. even during the Pleistocene. Yeah, you wouldn't have found these bordering up against Canada and stuff. They were along the bottom edge of North America, still widespread, you know, Mm -hmm. basically east to west, but not traveling up the continent completely. And with that, we're basically to the modern day. That's to, and, now, and then armadillos. Right yep. back and the then start. a while later, <laughs> nine bed and armadillos came I, to North America. We've talked about the Great American Interchange before. And oftentimes the interchange is discussed with regards to the things from the north moving south. Yep. And extinction events that had, right, right, all of our northern things moved down to the South America. And there was a lot of extinction and stuff. And we like to mention that, yeah, we in North America received marsupials yeah. and, and all, uh, you know, sloths and these things. This episode really does, I think, drive home for me that in addition to the sort of dramatic interpretation of the invasion of South America <laughs> by just all these poor South American animals seeing bears for the first time and dogs and cats. My goodness, cats. <laughs> And I think this, I think elephants might have to go back and and double check that. But like just all this ridiculous. But on the flip side, North America, the gates were opened for Xenorthrans. Yep. Giant crown slots and glyptodonts and pampathirs and just this eldritch assortment of giant armored animals coming up into North America. Yes. And that that's where my brain always focuses because... (laughs) Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness they got to finally spread out some. Yeah. Also, terror birds. Yeah. Like, there, there was a lot going on <laughs> that we were receiving at the time. Yep. <laughs> well, and then they had a rain, right? A, a rain in the southern part of North America. The rain of the Xenarthrans for a little while before the end Pleistocene uh, dealt with them. Well, and I, I always appreciate because it's so easy to look at something like a glyptodont and be like, well... Of course, that thing's extinct. It's so weird. Like, right. it, and that's <laughs> how very, could it survive today? Yeah, exactly. Like, in surely our world. that had to have been a weird, specialized, you know, one-off thing or something. Like, it's very easy to have that thought of it must not be here because it's so weird, right? Or it must have been it. It, it lived at a very specific time mm-hmm. under very specific conditions. But no, they were around for a long time. And then once they got to a brand new place with a brand new set of animals, they did well. Oh, yeah. And probably not a coincidence that the ones, while a lot of South American groups seemed to suffer during that exchange, one of the groups that didn't were the ones that were covered in body armor. Yes. Probably helped. Well, and I think it's also another good example of today's Xenarthra you you would not be put, you know, faulted if you looked at it and said, nah, they're not doing so great because... Right. Their numbers aren't particularly high. They aren't super spread out across the planet. Mm -hmm. They are definitely lower on the diversity scale and range scale compared to most other groups of mammals. But they were hardy. Like, there's nothing inherently about Xenarthrans that makes them unsuccessful. It's just they happen to get hit harder for whatever reason. And now we don't have as many. But when they were doing well, they did well even with massive shifts. Yeah. And it's fun to get a new perspective on armadillos as a group, because this is one of those examples where armadillos are a group that seem very rare and minor today. And that 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 may very well be my North American bias talking. Right. Yeah, we've got one kind of armadillo, basically, uh, that lives up here. Yeah, there's 20 more (laughs) down south. And so this is a cool chance to get to appreciate that armadillos actually are far more diverse and numerous today than it feels like at least to me and then we get to go to the fossil record and say wow you have you ain't seen nothing yet yes wait till you hear about what there used to be absolutely yeah i i love this group i think they are fun and adorable and s- so deliciously weird and then very unique mm-hmm. that like you said at the start there really isn't anything today like an armadillo well it's it's one of those uh, fun examples that you know, there's other things you can think of where if you deleted this animal, I can think of something that could probably I could put in its place. Not exactly, mm-hmm. but I could get close. I can't think of anything other than another armadillo. Right. And certainly <laughs> not in the Americas. No, <laughs> like <laughs> there's not much that can 
perfectly fill the armadillo-shaped hole they would leave if suddenly they were gone. Yeah. So everybody go to YouTube and look up videos of armadillos being adorable. Yes, please. It, sleepy three-banded armadillo is just one of the best things you can ever <laughs> see because they'll be half curled up and ours, who's named Plow, would cover his face with his big claws Aww. if you woke him up and would just stay sleeping while you talked about him to guests. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> Well, that ends our discussion, but before we end the episode, we have one last section. Every episode, we like to answer a question from our patrons, because as part of the benefits you get on Patreon at certain levels, you can ask us a question to have answered here on the podcast. So today, what is our question? This episode's patron question comes from Kylie. Kylie says... The Land Before Time, that was a movie, everybody, it was a movie about dinosaurs. Yeah. The Land Before Time came out in 1988. If time in the franchise passed at the same rate as it does in real life, which, if any, of the protagonists could still be alive today? (laughs) Have any died of old age? Kylie adds, let's count the second movie, too. Chomper was one of my favorites. Yeah. Chomper was a little baby Tyrannosaurus. Tyrannosaurus. (laughs) This is an... X, this is such a cool question. I, I love it. So for anyone unfamiliar with The Land Before Time or who has forgotten, the main characters of the movie are a group of very young dinosaurs. Yes. Including Littlefoot, uh, who is a sauropod, and Sarah, who's a ceratopsian, and Ducky the hadrosaur, and Petrie the pterosaur, and Spike the stegosaur. Yes. So this question is, would any of these baby dinosaurs, had they been born in 1988? Yeah. Which, in the movie, they're all like reasonably i think you could say within their first year or so of life oh yeah for sure spike is born during the movie yes yeah yep he is brand new and all the rest it is they are very young right so i'd say a year old is fine year within a year in this going on 2023 Mm -hmm. 34 years later how many of them would still be alive which is very easy math to do because we both I was, born, I was born the same year <laughs> yep. as The Land Before Time. <laughs> and I was the year after, so... And if, I still had to think about it. Yep, if if these dinosaurs were our age... Yes. Would they be dead? Would they still be here? <laughs> By the time Littlefoot was my age, he had been dead for two years. But, and man, like, I appreciate this question so much, Kylie, but if ever there was a, do you feel old yet? Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, I, I looked up what I could find for age ranges of these dinosaurs... And I was able to find some studies that have given us suspected age ranges for a few of them. Tyrannosaurus is a fairly well-known one Mm -hmm. because Sue, our oldest T-Rex, or at least one of the oldest, Mm -hmm. is roughly, we estimate, 28 years old. Yes. So nearing 30, which means that that's probably close to, based on all the evidence of that specimen, close to their maximum age, or at least average Mm -hmm. maximum age. So 30-ish, you know, is likely so chomper could be if they were particularly old is what i would say it's estimating dinosaur lifespans is a long-standing question and it's difficult because we have very very little evidence absolutely we don't get uh fossils that say this is the oldest that we could potentially get no so most of what i've read has said here are some examples we have like sue who's almost 30 and then i did i've seen one paper that had estimates based on body size. Yeah. Little dinosaurs were probably living maybe five to ten years, whereas bigger ones like T-Rex might have gone into their 30s or so. And then the biggest ones like sauropods maybe were living longer than that. Yes. And that's basically what I found is mm-hmm. typically they were suggesting around 30-ish or, you know, close to there. Like I found some estimates for uh, certain hadrosaurs of getting up to like 20s. Mm-hmm. And then sauropods, various estimates, but like potentially 70s and stuff like that. Sauropods, I've seen gone back and forth a lot. Mm -hmm. Because there used to be very common that you'd see uh, that sauropods could live for hundreds of years. Yeah, because how else are you going to get that big? Right. But that doesn't seem to be uh, the consensus of most science and and data these days. Uh, But I have seen people suggest that they might have been able to go 30s, 40s, 50s, simply by virtue of being large animals. Yes. Large animals tend to be longer lived. Yep. I saw one paper that was noting the 70 years was for a 90% maximal size for a patasaurus. That's based off the specimens they were looking at. That was their estimate for to get full sized. Mm-hmm. 
taking that long. But it is a very difficult metric. Unfortunately, most of the numbers we've been saying are less than the number of years it has been. (laughs) So even with our estimates. And this, I think, brings up another good thing to mention. Most dinosaur fossils are not fully grown animals. Because most animals don't make it to full adulthood. Yes. So Kylie asked, how would any of them have died of old age? Seems like we're at a right time frame Mm -hmm. that a lot of them very possibly would have died of old age by this time. Or be very, very close. Except maybe Littlefoot. Yep. If if sauropods were living longer. But more likely, most or all of them would have died simply by predation or disease or the very many things that kill wild animals. Now, in fairness... All of our dinosaurs we're talking about were protagonists. That's true. So they uh, have a much higher chance. As long as they don't get replaced yes. in later, uh, uh, which, which, as I understand the Land Before Time franchise, they don't. No, they still seem to be. <laughs> they stick around. And as long as they keep rotating voice actors, mm-hmm. those dinosaurs can live forever. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is not likely that m- most of that group would still be <laughs> at least kicking around. Right. And maybe I'm sure... you could talk to old Littlefoot, yeah. you know, reminiscing about his time with his friends who are all sadly passed. And I couldn't find any estimates for pterosaurs, but it, yeah. it is also likely that some of these species would have probably died much younger than others. Like, right. it's potentially that Petrie might have died out, you know, 10, 15 years right, ago. way early on. But who knows? Because I, I could not find anything. So speaking as uh, people who were born in the 80s and grew up in the 90s, uh, we would like to formally apologize to everybody else out there who's at the same age as us yep. for this terrible news. Absolutely. There is a follow-up question. Oh, yeah. Kylie says, P.S. Will, when you say, yup, 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 you're doing ducky, right? Yeah, I am. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Thanks for that question, <laughs> Kylie. Thanks to everyone for listening. We're sorry again uh, for the story of our, our dear departed cartoon animals. For hypothetically killing, <laughs> for <laughs> literally killing your childhoods. <laughs> yes. <laughs> indeed but with that we can wrap up this episode thanks to all of our patrons our requesters our everyone who supports us as always if you have questions comments anything more you'd like to hear on the topic of armored mammals or anything else please contact us email social media and so forth if you read through the episode description you will find ways to access the blog the social media that audible link that you can get audiobooks and also support the podcast uh the end of the year q a submission form submit your questions if you want to know about if you want to hear us kill off other beloved cartoon characters (laughs) that might be an avenue for it who else that you love would be dead (laughs) (laughs) what's the lifespan of a toaster (laughs) so check out all those links down in the episode description and we can sign off i don't have anything clever for armadillos we release episodes every fortnight. Sure do. And hey, there's also an alley episode coming up. Yes, there is. Plants at the end of the year. So stay tuned. And we'll see you next time with something not armadillo related. I never did beat Donkey Kong 64. No. You needed to get, in order to unlock the last boss, you needed to get two special coins. And one of them required you to play the original Donkey Kong arcade game. I've heard of this. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't do it and never beat it. Yeah, because old games are way harder. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it haunts me. It haunts me to this day, the un, the unfinished <laughs> boss of Donkey Kong 64. At least I have Army Dillo. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.